on Business Incorporated today. South Africa's manufacturing output drops 2.3% in May. While exports of manufactured goods double in Zanzibar in 2022. And Zimbabwe's power utility gets go ahead to build exporters in Forex. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Will Ebong. We kick off as always with market numbers from Africa where trading sentiment were mostly in the red. Nigeria's NGX opens the trading week marginally down at 0.02% at intraday after the salad break while South Africa's GSE is much lower at 0.65% at intraday. Elsewhere, Egypt's EGX30 is still closed, same as Kenya. Now to the Middle East, where it's mostly negative sentiments observed from major equities in the region with Saudi Arabia as the only gainer. The Abu Dhabi and Dubai exchanges were down at intraday. Both indexes fell 0.51 and 0.55% each. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia's index rose by 0.32%, while the Qatari exchange traded in opposite direction, down by over 1.6% at intraday. Now in Europe... Many are wondering, should companies be taxed more because inflation is driving up their earnings? That's some question. That's the question some European governments are asking themselves amid growing consumer frustrations over rising prices. Now Madrid has announced a plan to tax the earnings of banks, which are earning more on higher borrowing rates. Stephen Beardsley is right there in Berlin. Stephen, tell us more about this plan. Well, the Spanish government announced this plan just yesterday. It's essentially a temporary windfall tax on two sectors, banking industry and energy companies. These are uh, two areas that are believed to profit or po they're poised to profit from uh, rising prices. Uh, banks in terms of rising interest rates and energy companies uh, through those soaring energy prices that we've seen in recent months, oil, gas, electricity rates in general. Um, you know, Madrid has not given the specifics on this plan yet. They haven't said which companies specifically will be affected. They haven't named the rate. Uh, what they have said is that they plan to raise $7 billion through this measure uh, and that they will use that to try and uh, insulate the, the effect of rising prices on the public in general. So they want to fund measures that could help um, offset inflation. Uh, we know that there are other countries in Europe who have also either put in measures or are looking to put in measures. Um, the UK, for example, passing a windfall tax on energy companies. Uh, Belgium saying that it intends to do so. Uh, in both cases, 25%. Uh, Germany has played around with the idea, but we haven't seen any concrete measures yet. Um, it's in a special circumstance where it's actually trying to save some of its major utilities due to the situation with the war and falling Russian gas imports. So a little bit, a little bit of a different dynamic in Germany, but we are seeing this issue come up more and more across Europe. This is say, what are they saying about this? Well, markets have had their say first, and what we've seen is that uh, the major banks in Spain have all seen their shares dive uh, over the past few hours since this has been announced. Uh, market analysts also changing their prognoses for these banks, um, trending them downwards. So uh, it is believed to take a hit. Um, you know, in the UK, the oil companies there are saying uh, the tax on uh, the, the new windfall tax on them is going to have an effect um, on what they can do, and uh, that it basically it's, it's sending mixed signals because on the one hand, the government is demanding more production from from them to help offset those rising costs or to help lower those rising costs. On the other hand, it says that if it's going to be taxed, it's going to have less resources with which to invest in further production. Now, companies in general are saying that economic headwinds are really going to cut into their profits regardless in the months ahead as recession looms potentially, uh, and then with the ongoing war in Europe, and then, of course, the corona pandemic is not over yet. Mm, so what can we expect from markets, uh, European markets today, seeing all these um going on will continue to weigh down markets. We've seen them stumble at the gate uh, with markets uh, in Frankfurt, Paris, and London all falling immediately. All eyes right now are on the U.S. and the latest uh, inflation reading that's coming out later today. That will set the tone for global markets because it, uh, it will give us an idea of how fast and hard the, the Federal Reserve may move on further interest rate hikes in the U.S., the world's largest economy that has a ripple effect across markets. Uh, it also has an effect on the euro. Uh, euro parity with the dollar was 
was briefly reached yesterday. Uh, the euro remains close to parity with the dollar still. Uh, and so that's also having a dampening effect on some businesses and some markets. Um, so all eyes will be on that. And um, otherwise, recession fears will continue uh, to be the issue in, in the, in the, in likely in the days ahead, and especially as we see more uh, quarterly earnings reports in the days and the weeks ahead. Thanks a lot, Stephen, for that update. And in the UK, it's still mostly about the higher than expected growth in the economy in the midst of rising prices. Juliana is in London and has the update. Hi, Juliana. What are market reactions to the 0.5% surprise growth in May? Good afternoon. Well, well, no surprises that the pound surged um, following that data released by the Office for National Statistics about uh, the UK economy in May. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, it was a huge surprise, this 0.5% month-on-month growth, because if you look around, everybody uh, was forecasting a pretty gloomy data, including the Bank of England and the International uh, Monetary Fund. But uh, because of a surge in services, well, in fact, there was a surge um, across all uh, three key sectors, which includes manufacturing and construction, um, uh, the economy defied expectations and we got a half a percentage uh, raise. So this did push up uh, the pound and because of course we know that the FTSE 100 is internationally uh, focused. When the pound rises, usually the FTSE falls and that's the case at intraday. The all share is currently down by 0.70%. Uh, the FTSE 100 down by 0.79% and the FTSE 250, the domestic market, is down by 0.23%. Uh, As I said, uh, the British pound surged against the U.S. dollar, currently trading up 0.33 percent, though lower against the euro, uh, but up against the Japanese yen by 0.57 percent, Will. Well, thanks a lot, Juliana. We see that is going to probably trickle into other sectors. We see that Boohoo is probably trying to, you know, uh, profit from this because the online specialist has become the latest retailer to start charging shoppers to return items this is not good for uh, good news for customers who have buyers remorse as it is you know just like Elon, Elon Musk did Absolutely right. Not good for people that uh, have buyer's remorse. And as you know, during the pandemic, online shopping boomed. Um, and if you're like me, and I think judging by the reaction, most people are like me. If you buy something online, you are more likely to return it because you're not sure whether it fits, whether the color is the same. And this is the reason why Boohoo last week, uh, Monday, decided to change its returns policy. So they now are going to charge customers £1.99 every time they return turn an item. And I think this is likely to be a problem for fast fashion retailers like Boohoo because most of their items are pretty cheap anyway. So if you're buying a dress for £9.99, would you want to return it for £1.99? I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, the, the retailer has decided to do it. But as you said, they're not the only one. They follow along the footsteps of Zara, Next and Uniqlo. And that is because if you look back into May uh, when Boohoo did uh, release uh, their end of year Profits, a lot of the slump was attributed uh, to customers who have been returning items and they can't stomach that anymore. But I think one of the, 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 the reasons that they've made public as to why they're deciding to do this is because of shipping costs. It's just so expensive to do it. They can't handle the burden. And they said to customers that it's a lot more greener uh, for you to stick with an item and keep it rather than uh, returning it um, and, uh, you know, uh, causing um, all that CO2 emission. So that's the reason why. Uh, no surprises um, that people have flocked to social media, dismayed um, and outraged um, at the change in policy. But this is probably something that we're going to expect from more retailers um, as the time tickles on. Uh, I, I think all they have to do is probably just, you know, start reselling the items if it don't fit, Juliana. <laughs> Thank you so much for that update. <laughs> And now we move to Asia Pacific, where shares were higher on Wednesday as China released trade data and the Bank of Korea and Reserve Bank of New Zealand hiked rates. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index gave up earlier gains to trade above the flat line in its uh, 
In its uh, final hour of session, Tianxi Lithium plunged more than 11% at its market debut in Hong Kong from its offer price of 82 Hong Kong dollars. It was down around 4% in its final hour of trade. Miniso shares also dropped in its debut on the Hong Kong market. Japan's Nikkei 225 rose 0.54% to close, and the Topics Index gained 0.29%. In South Korea, the Kospi advanced 0.47% to 2,328 0.61 points and the Kozdak was 1.65% higher. The S&P ASX 200 in Australia was mostly flat during the session but gained 0.23% to close. Mainland China markets initially struggled for direction but closed higher. The Shanghai Composite was slightly higher at 3,284.29 points and the Shenzhen component rose 0.56% to 12,508.89 points. Stocks futures in the U.S. were little changed in early trade on Wednesday as investors awaited a key inflation report that is expected to show a fresh high. Futures on the Dow Jones Industrial Average and S&P 500 rose 0.13% and 0.16% each, while the Nasdaq 100 futures edged up 0. 24%. The consumer price index due today is expected to climb by 8.8% in June on a year-on-year -year basis, according to economists. And that would be even higher than May's 8.6 reading, which was the biggest increase since 1981. Meanwhile, investors will monitor second quarter corporate earnings as major banks are set to report this week. JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley are slated to post results Thursday before the bell. Now, oil edged up early on Wednesday, a day after settling below $100 a barrel for the first time since April, and gains were limited by a U.S. supply report showing rising inventories and caution ahead of U.S. inflation data. Despite a tight fiscal oil market, investors have sold oil futures on worries that aggressive rate hikes to stem inflation will slow economic growth and hit oil demand. Prices fell more than uh, more than 7% on Tuesday in volatile trade. Brent crude was up 0.74% at $100.20 a barrel. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude gained 0.9% to $96.77. Also, the latest U.S. supply report from the Energy Information Administration will be in focus. Analysts expect a decline in crude and gasoline inventories. Now, gold prices hovered near a more than nine-month low early on Wednesday, with the dollar continuing to hurt bullion demand, while investors awaited monthly U.S. inflation data for cues on the road ahead for the Federal Reserve's monetary policy. Spot gold was little changed at $1,726.27 per ounce after dropping to its lowest level since late September. U.S. gold futures dipped 0.2% to $1,721.80. Spot silver firm 0.3%. Platinum rose 2% and palladium gained 0.2% to $2,029.90. After the break, more stories from the African continent. Stay with us. Welcome back. In recent times, Africa has been faced with economic recession worsened by the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war and COVID-19 pandemic. Last week, only the president of the African Development Bank, Mr. Kiwumi Adishino, said Africa needs $424 billion to recover from pandemic devastation. Governments and organizations search, are searching for solutions to address the multifaceted challenges facing sustainable development in Africa. Mr. David Ameyo, CEO, International Center for Evaluation and Development, joins me to discuss this. Good afternoon, Mr. Ameyo. Good to have you. Good afternoon. Happy to be here. Mr. Ameyo, what, what is the gap? Uh, we'll just paint a picture for us. What's the gap between policy and development in Africa? You know, uh, policy as a whole is the process of uh, drafting or formulating an action plan that goes through uh, the legislation to be voted. Development is how do you put those action plan into practice, you know, that will transform people's life. So in Africa, we have policies that are being made, you know, economic policies, social policies, policy on gender, policy on agriculture, different types of policy. The question comes, how do we uh, activate or actualize the policy to improve people's life? 
let me give you an example. You know, we have in Ghana a seed policy that the government has made that, you know, within the ECOWAS, people can import seed from one country to another so that farmers can have access to seed. It's a policy. It has been approved. It has been, you know, uh, gazetted. The actual development comes when the people have opportunity to import the seed, have the system, the, the agro dealers, the distribution system, the pricing system for it to get to the farmer who is planting the seed. So you see, it is, it's easy or simple to formulate a policy. When it comes to development, that is where the problem comes. How do you translate the policy so that people's life can be improved, the livelihood can change? Okay, Mr. Mayor, you talked about importation of inputs uh, for farmers, but many African countries, as we are, as it seems, are more imp import dependent. And does it appear too late right now to flip from being import dependent to export oriented in this time of higher inflation, higher energy costs, and higher inputs, as it seems? That, that, is, that is exactly what we are talking about. What is the government policy? Okay, we have uh, agro, uh, seed breeders maybe in a country who are uh, working to develop variety of seeds. But if the government policy does not put restriction on import and individuals, private sector can import the seed, let's say from South Africa, Korea or Ukraine or Vietnam or any place at a cheaper price, then it is going to affect the local breeding of the seed. And uh, in, the long term, in the long term, it is going to affect the breeders' you know, outlook on production. So how do you do the policy? Do you do the policy to support local industries? Or because of comparative advantage, you do the policy so that it will encourage imports? These are some of the things, uh, the challenges that the government face every day. We take Nigeria, for example. The question is, do we import cheap rice from Vietnam and other areas? Or do we make a policy to put a tariff or ban on importation of rice so that local farmers will have the opportunity Maybe in the short term, the price will be higher, but maybe in the long term, you know, the price will come down for everybody to be able to afford the, 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 the rice. So what, what kind of policies can we see in Africa to help increase private sector participation? You talked about local indigenous companies um, trying to thrive in Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and elsewhere. How do you see, what kind of policies do you see that will help to drive participation of private sectors in the economy? You know, when you, when you come to policy development, there are so many factors that influence the policy. Before a government can come up with a policy, there should be a problem, okay? What is the problem? So there should be a, a problem analysis. Based on the problem analysis, we look at the different options that are available. And looking at the options, you look at different evidence. There should be different studies. Maybe there's nothing new under the sun. So maybe this challenge we are facing other countries have faced it, either in Africa or any lower and middle income country, the global south. How did they uh, go about it? What is the evidence that the solution they proposed have worked or have not worked? So you look at all these things. So either you are looking at literature or you are looking at different evaluations that have been done or different uh, systematic reviews that have been done so that you will be able to get the evidence. Based on the evidence and based on your context and based on the resources 
and the, the, the situation in your country, you are able to develop a policy out of based on an evidence, something that has been done before or something that needs to be done. If it has not been done be before, do you have a room to experiment to see if it will work? So all this research have to go before a policy can be developed. The question we have in Africa is, do we have the resources? Do we have the time? Do we have the, 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 the people to develop this, to generate this evidence that can be synthesized and used to inform policy? These are some of the things. So it's not just a single policy. You know, there is not a single policy that can solve the problem. But even if we identify the problem, okay. what is the evidence to support a policy formulation? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. David Ameo, CEO, International Center for Evaluation and Development, for sharing your thoughts with us on sustainable development in Africa. We look forward to evidence-based policy making in the future. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now move on to other stories. South Africa's manufacturing output fell 2.3% year on year in May, following a sharp decline of 7.6% in April. According to Statistics South Africa, this reflects a contraction in four out of five major manufacturing subdivisions. Seasonal, uh, seasonal adjusted factory production fell 0.2% month on month in May, following a downwardly revised um, contraction of 5.7% month on month in April. Meanwhile, analysts had predicted a 2.4% decline in annual terms in May and a 1.5% month-on-month increase. Meanwhile, South Africa's food prices continue to soar at the mid-year point, according to data from the, uh, the PMBEJD um, organization with the group's household affordability index showing particular concern the impact of rising food and living costs on the country's poorest. The group recorded its household food basket at 4,688 rand and 81 cents in June 2022. Month on month, the average cost of the basket increased by 78 rand and 92 cents. Year on year, the basket is up by 5 160 rand and 57 cents. The maximum wage of 3,895 rand in June 2022 for a family of 4.3 persons is 906 rand and 3 cents, which is below the upper bound poverty line of 1,335 rand per capita per month. And now in Zanzibar, the exports of manufactured goods have doubled in 2022. The recent figures from Tanzania Revenue Authority and Bank of Tanzania shows exports of manufactured goods from Zanzibar reached $10.4 million in May 2022 from $6.67 million recorded in May 2021, representing a 56% increase. The fast growth of exports indicates the country's smart move of aisles towards industrialization drive. Manufacturing has become an important sector, stimulating the recovery of the Zanzibar economy after the tourism sector was hit by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Zimbabwe's central bank is giving power utility companies ZESA the green light to start charging exporters in foreign currency. According to the central bank, ZESA can now bill exporters of goods and services in dollars, euros, and other foreign currencies at the international cross rate. Exporters that will be affected by the new regulations are those that export about 80% or more per quarter of total output of goods and services produced or provided in Zimbabwe, for which it lawfully receives any foreign currency. And that's it on Business Incorporated. I'm Will Ibon. Thanks for watching.